Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun, deep in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. And today we have some demands that we need to talk about. One coming out of the Trump prosecution. We've been following this along a little bit. Donald Trump appeared in New York, had his arraignment, spoke after the matter, and we were wondering, what is Congress going to do about this, if anything? And it looks like they may be doing something. The gears are turning. We're going to turn our attention over to a letter that came from the House GOP. Jim Jordan, representative, sent a letter over to Mark Pomerantz. We've talked a lot about Mark. He was one of the former prosecutors from New York who resigned after Alvin Bragg got elected because Alvin Bragg decided he wasn't going to prosecute Trump anymore. And he threw a big hissy fit over there and he wrote a book about it and he started another organization about it and made a ton of money. And then he got his wish because he threw a temper tantrum and probably didn't invite Alvin to any more cocktail parties or something. And so then Alvin decided to prosecute. Well, GOP is now sending a letter over to Mark Pomerantz. They're asking him, uh, we're very curious about what your involvement was in this. It sounds like you might have been using the prosecutor's office and the levers of government to wage a political war against Donald Trump by writing books and by making this your entire life's work. So Bragg's office responded. It's actually a pretty substantive letter. So we will go through that here from our friend Jim Jordan, all as part of the Trump update. Then we've got some pretty wild news out of the Proud Boys trial. Apparently, at least, at least 40 informants or agents there on January 6th as part of the Proud Boys or amongst the defendants. Now, we don't know if there were 40 informants who were specifically focused only on the Proud Boys, or if they were just there generally, or what the scope is, how far away are these connections? We don't know. But 40 agents? We've talked about this. There's just over 100 violent crimes with weapons or so. And so if you have almost a, over a third of these violent offenders had a one-to-one -one relationship with informants and other agents. Why did this happen? We'll come back to all that. Now, as usual, Brandy Buckman is going to be reporting on the trial for us. Make sure you're giving her a follow at Brandy Buckman on Twitter. We've got the full trial to go through day 52, and it's going to be a doozy. And so if you want to be a part of the show, my friends, we always invite you to become a member. That's a great way to support what we do here at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We try to make it worthwhile. We do extra streams. We have a great community. Come check us out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And if you're a member on YouTube, as we had a bunch of members just join here today, courtesy of our friend Curtis Bartle, you can also grab the Telegram link, which is where we post stuff and share stuff before and after the stream ends. And it's where we also have our after parties for our YouTube members. So come and join us over there. Now, before we get into all the meat and potatoes of the day, we got to make sure we eat our vegetables because our vegetables are the things that keep us healthy. And we would all like to lose some of those little leftover pandemic pounds here in the United States. It's about to be summertime. We've got to, you know, start to throw up a little bit. But how sick are you of all those ads for the weight loss pills and all the fad diets? You know, we've all been there. We've all done that. And they just don't work. But you know what does? Eating healthy. Go figure. Daily servings fruits and vegetables every day. You do that, you imagine the weight just falls right off. But I know vegetables, not a fan. Who's got time to prepare the fruit every day? You know, I was peeling an orange the other day. It's like, gosh, it's a lot of work. It's good. It's a, it's a lot of work. But you can also get it in your field of greens. Field of greens is a science-backed formula, very specific fruits and vegetables that you're not going to find in any other product. And we know that proper nutrition reboots your metabolism so you can burn calories faster and lose weight the healthier way. In Field of Greens, it's the only brand backed by a better health promise. And look, you're going to look healthier and feel healthier, but the greater proof is going to come at your next checkup when your doctor says, wow, whatever you're doing, you look great. Keep it up. So let's get you started. Go on over to fieldofgreens.com. Save 15% when you check out using code Robert. They've got a ton of good stuff over there. And so check out fieldofgreens.com, code Robert. Remember, the vegetables want to be eaten. Get your field of greens for your parents. Tell your mom, eat your vegetables, mom. How do you like it, you know? My mom's eating hers. Fieldofgreens.com, save 15% with code Robert. All right, and so let's get into the meat and potatoes on the day because we do have some business to attend to 
starting with the Trump prosecution, which is still underway. House Republicans fire back at the New York prosecutor's office, demanding answers from this guy, Mark Pomerantz. Now, he's not currently at the New York prosecutor's office, but he used to be. He's a former special prosecutor, somebody who was brought in specifically to go wage war against Donald Trump. And remember, a lot of people in New York have been doing this for a long time. Alvin Bragg, one of the conditions of him running was that he was going to go and prosecute Trump. And so he got elected. And there were people who were already in this game, like Mark, who were very upset, very angry when Alvin Bragg said, I'm not going to continue the prosecution. And in fact, Mark threw a hissy fit. He wrote a book about this. He was appearing on 60 Minutes and he was saying, you know, I dedicated my whole life to this. This is very important to me. Trump's a menace and we have to eliminate him and all this stuff. And we're going to listen to a clip from him. But he's the guy who actually got the subpoena along with a letter from Jim Jordan. And Jim Jordan now is you know, in the House. The Republicans control the House. And Jim Jordan is on the Judiciary Committee. And he's fired off this pretty fiery letter. And it's quite long. And the question, of course, is going to be, what jurisdiction does Jim Jordan have? And what business does he have over a former prosecutor who's not even in the office anymore? And so we'll get into all of that. But first, here is the book that Mr. Pomerantz actually drafted. This is what he wrote, released it February 7th. 2023, which is pretty close in time to where this whole indictment thing was going down. We're all wondering what his involvement was, because this is not just about a regular criminal prosecution. We keep hearing that, you know, nobody's above the law. It's like if Trump got a speeding ticket, we should throw him in jail just for that. You know, and it's all this 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 gamesmanship of it's just the law. That's it. It's not politics. No, of course not. But you see people like this who are kind of engaging in politics on the back of the law. Mark Pomerantz is a special prosecutor. He, he was focused specifically on the prosecution of Trump, writes a book about it, 385 re reviews, charging 15 bucks a Kindle, boom, just pop, popping them off to all the Trump psychos out there with TDS. Oh yeah, perfect. More, 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 you know, TDS material for me to read on the toilet. And it's Donald Trump here with Lady Liberty and the red flag, his red tie over his head. All right, so you get the picture of who we're talking about. Now, after Alvin Bragg won the election and he was thrown into power, Mark Pomerantz learned that Alvin Bragg was not going to be prosecuting Donald Trump. And how dare he? And Pomerantz threw a fit about this on 60 Minutes. He said, I can't believe this. If you take, get I hate Trump. It's Trump. There's all sorts of prosecutorial discretion. Many other prosecutors have reviewed this case and declined it. Even Alvin Bragg seemed like he was going to do that until he got some last surprise witness, whatever that is. Why are you now calling this a failure? So somebody at some point had a decision that it wasn't a good case. So there was disagreement at some point. And Alvin Bragg himself has admitted that this was resurrected. They called this the zombie case. Where did this come from? It's been around in the garbage in the closet for a long time. They dug it back out. How come? Is it because they are, is a distraction they need? Is it because it's part of a bigger orchestration? Shot one in a three-part series. The trilogy is coming. Georgia and special counsel are next. Mark Pomerantz, who spent one... All right. 11 yeah, let's listen to this bio for the whole separate case, right? This was the Trump org case, not even related to this particular indictment. But this guy is just combing over everything because he spent a year doing this. And do you think he would have anybody on his team that would lodge an objection to this and say, hey, Mark, you know, I'm on your team. I'm just a conscientious objector. Uh, objector. I don't actually think there's enough here. Or did he just go and round up a bunch of Trump psychos who want to prosecute him? And no, they can use the strong arm of the government. Trump is a murderer. Wow, genius. Okay, so that's what's going on on network TV. So that's Mark Pomerantz, a former special prosecutor playing patty cake with 60 Minutes guy. And shout out to 60 Minutes. I actually kind of, you know, Think that they do interesting work from time to time. They did have Marjorie Taylor Greene on after all. And so Mark Pomerantz is the special prosecutor who's no longer there, but he's getting letters over from Jim Jordan. And so here is what happened right after Trump gets arraigned in court. Prosecution continues. The House seems like they're doing something about it. House GOP fires off the first subpoena and the probe of the Trump indictment. From Politico, the summons is sparking a fresh rebuke from Manhattan DA. We'll hear what he had to say in a minute. They call it part of an unprecedented campaign of harassment and intimidation, which I didn't hear them crying when the J6 committee, which was illegally constituted, by the way, just read HR 503, then 
why are they crying now? J6 committee could do whatever they wanted under the purview of Congress. We're Congress. Rule 10 says we can do whatever we want. I'm Liz Cheney. I'm crying Kins Kinzinger. And they could have full reign of the full power of the legislative branch. Here, Jim Jordan doesn't have it, apparently. Well, we'll see about that. Now, the House GOP on Thursday fired off its first subpoena in its investigation of the DA Alvin Bragg, escalating a standoff over the indictment of former President Trump. He is the House Judiciary Chair from Ohio, summoning Mark Pomerantz, who we just heard from, former county assistant district attorney, to be uh, appear behind closed doors for a depot April 20th. Mark your calendars. Politico got a copy of the subpoena. Now, there is a letter that we're going to read through. They say it's a little unusual for Congress to subpoena a line prosecutor. And Jordan, in his Thursday letter, we're going to see alleges that Bragg's office told Pomerantz not to cooperate. Bragg's office issued a fiery response. Pomerantz issued a rebuke and a book, wrote a book, where he included details of this investigation. Okay, so he's making this public now. All this, the secret investigation that he does is now public. So that's how this works. You can just go work for a prosecutor's office, prosecute your political enemies, not bring charges, use the prosecutor's office to get leverage, go investigate this, maybe issue a subpoena. Hey, I'm from the prosecutor's office. I want to have an interview with you. Come down to my office for a year, rummage through all of his records, look at all of his spreadsheets, subpoena this, subpoena that. And then when charges don't get brought, he just leaves and writes a book about it and details it anyways. It's disgusting, right? It's it's going in and exploiting your position, your time at the government, and then using it against your political opponents. They have no shame if they're not actually using the FBI to go and abuse Republicans, in particular Trump. Then they go work at state level prosecutors, and if they don't do anything, they leave and write a book about it. So the January 6th committee, Politico, is very interesting that they admit this. The January 6th select committee used a similar argument against White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows' resistance to a summons, saying he waived any potential privileges by releasing a book that describes some of the interactions with the former president. Meadows was later held in contempt of Congress for refusing to testify, but the DOJ declined to prosecute him. Oh, interesting. So there is some precedent here. Yeah, the January 6th committee said a bunch of it, and we're very happy to see that the pendulum is swinging the other way. I wish there was no pendulum, to be quite frank about it. I wish we had competent government that didn't weaponize everything to go and prosecute political enemies. But it all started now with this committee. Well, it started a long time ago, but this committee is the latest iteration of it. J6 committee started it. This committee's responding. Another witness who wrote a book, Peter Navarro, is currently being prosecuted for this, for contempt of Congress. They started it. We covered that case. You better respond to a subpoena from Congress or else. Jordan told Pomerantz, we'll read the letter. The subpoena just came days before Trump appeared in New York. Of course, we've covered that in detail. Multiple volleys back and forth. Oversight, James Comer. Administration Brian Steele last week requested a list of questions that they would want to ask. Now, there's some conversation about specifically subpoenaing Bragg. Says that Dubeck, while urging Republicans to negotiate before a potential subpoena of Bragg, also offered a blistering critique of the investigation in her letter calling the accusations of a political persecution baseless. Bragg's office responded, and we'll go through some of this. Now, the Dubeck letter is, it, we'll, we'll see if that pops up. But anyway, so that is what is happening. That is from House GOP Jim Jordan. We'll read the letter, but before we get there, let's listen to Jim Jordan explain this when he was on with Fox and Friends. Uh, let's bring in Congressman Jim Jordan. He's chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and he's also the weaponiz weaponization of government. Uh, Congressman, we, we, we didn't know we didn't know. Yeah. Now that we've seen the 16-page indictment, does that make you more apt to make sure that Alvin Bragg comes to Washington to testify to explain himself? 
Yeah, because he said yesterday he had additional evidence. I didn't see any additional evidence. And he said 34 counts. I think that's the, the, the invoices, the vouchers, and the checks, and it totals up to 34. So I think a lot of people thought there was no case here before his announcement yesterday, before the arraignment yesterday, before we got to see the indictment. But now after we've seen all that yesterday, I think people think it's even more political than we thought uh, beforehand. Of course, my big takeaway is just how relentless they've been after President Trump. I mean, they spy on his campaign, they raid his home, now they indict him for a campaign finance violation when he didn't even use campaign funds. It's ridiculous, but I think even more important than all that is this is about all of us. I don't think it's an accident that this happens the same month we learned that the FTC went to a private company and said, who are the journalists you're talking to? We have two of those journalists testify in front of Congress and, and the Democrats ask them who their sources are. While the Democrats are asking one of those journalists those questions, the IRS is knocking on his door. I tell you this is about intimidation. This is about chilling everyone's speech, making everyone stay in line. Even the judge yesterday said, hey, Mr. Trump, President Trump, be careful what you say. I think that's a message to all us regular yep. folks across the heartland. And to me, that's the most alarming thing of all. Yeah, if Trump is silenced, if he's got to be extra careful about it, what about the rest of us? It feels like Trump is shackled, which emanates to the rest of the party emanates to the rest of the movement because maybe you're concerned that you're going to get indicted i'm bars of, of course not and everyone i mean I, what should happen this case never should have been brought and what should happen now should it should get dismissed but we're gonna have to wait to what i think december 4th is the hearing and the and the trial is scheduled for even uh, into next year into next january of course why not uh, this is ridiculous Let everyone it gets it remember the Department of Justice wouldn't bring the case. The former uh, district attorney, Cy Vance, wouldn't bring the case. And even Alvin Bragg himself wouldn't bring the case mm -hmm. until two of his guys resign, Mark. catch a fit, get the left all fired up. And maybe most importantly, until Donald Trump announces he was running for president again yeah. and is leading in all the polls. So suddenly Alvin Bragg has a change of heart and decides to bring the case. And as again, as I said earlier, what we saw yesterday only makes, I think only makes us wonder like what, what is going on here? Yeah. Uh, again, with the star witness being Michael Cohen. I remember when Michael Cohen was in front of the oversight committee four years ago and lied six times to Congress. That's their key witness. That's the guy they're going to build this case on. I, I, I just don't get it. See, I it's hard to get Jim Jordan because there's not much there. We read through the entire indictment and in the indictment itself, it was just a copy and paste of recurring payments essentially. And it looked to me like there was an argument that there, this could have been a retainer, that he was making monthly installments, monthly payments. Michael Cohen was on call. Michael Cohen, in many of the letters that we reviewed, confirmed through his counsel. And you can read the letters. They're all available at spotlightlawyer.com slash Trump. The full mind map is there. You can see the letters that Cohen's lawyer sent to the FEC, two of them. You can see the letters that Stormy Daniels sent. All of this was corroborated by Robert Costello, who said that Michael Cohen told him a long time ago that Trump knew nothing about this. And there's all sorts of, of evidence that Michael Cohen is just not credible and they're basing their entire case on him no i mean look we, we don't know what's going on there we'll see we'll see what happens what i do know is the left never stops that's I mean, true it was 2016 they spied on this campaign 2018 it was Mueller investigation 2020 it was suppressing the hunter biden laptop story 2022 it's raiding his home 91 days before the election and now it's this in the run-up to the 2024 presidential race as i've said many times before why won't they just let we, the people, decide who we want representing in an uh, in office? Why do they always have to, the FBI or the left, get involved in every single election trying to put their finger on the scale? They've been out to get President Trump for ever since he's, he, he went in public life and, and ran for office. And I think it's because he's actually fighting for we, the people, not fighting for the establishment in the swamp here. And that's the, that's the key problem I think the left has with President Trump. I don't think it's because they're cheaters. They can't play fair. Everything they touch is an effort to manipulate it to their advantage. It doesn't matter what you look at, whether it's – you can extrapolate from there. But the point is there is constant cheating from the Democrats. And here is finally the letter from Jim Jordan. This is what he was talking about. Sent April 6 from the United States Congress House of Representatives Judiciary Committee. Jim Jordan from Ohio sends the letter over to Mark Pomerantz, 
former New York County Special Assistant DA. He's now with the Free and Fair Litigation Group, which is an organization we've talked about previously. Now, it writes from Jim Jordan, Dear Mr. Pomerantz, The Committee on the Judiciary is conducting oversight of Alvin Bragg's unprecedented indictment of Trump. He's currently a declared candidate, you know. Now, they say on March 22nd, we requested that you, Mark, voluntarily cooperate with our oversight by providing relevant documents and testimony pertaining to your role when you were special assistant DA leading the investigation into Trump. Jordan says, we received a reply from you dated March 27th, stating that at the instruction of the DA's office, Alvin Bragg, that you would not cooperate with our oversight. Wow. Now, you enclosed a copy of the letter that Alvin sent you, directing you not to cooperate. So even Alvin is telling him, be quiet about this, Marky. Jordan says the Supreme Court, Mark, has recognized that Congress has a broad and indispensable power to conduct oversight, which encompasses inquiries into the administration of existing laws and other things. This is very familiar language. This is what the J6 committee used to say. Rule 10 of the House of Representatives authorizes the Committee on Judiciary to conduct oversight of criminal justice matters related and to inform potential litigation. Congress has a specific and manifestly important interest in preventing politically motivated prosecutions of current and former presidents by elected state and local prosecutors, particularly in jurisdictions like New York County, where the prosecutor is popularly elected and trial level judges lack life tenure, meaning they could be subject to the whims of a recall. Jordan says, among other things, Mark, if state or local prosecutors like you are able to engage in politically motivated prosecutions of presidents for personal acts, this could have a pretty profound impact on how presidents choose to exercise their powers while in office. For example, Jordan says, a president could choose to avoid taking action he believes to be in the national interest because it might negatively impact New York City. And then the New York City prosecutor might prosecute him. So a president now can't exercise authority over the whole country. And sometimes you have to make decisions for the country that might improp or might not be equally beneficial to all the governments, which might cause one of those governments to get angry and prosecute you. Congress says, could that happen? Who knows? Now, as a result, the DA's unprecedented prosecutorial conduct requires oversight to inform Congress about legislative reforms that might address politically motivated state prosecutors. Jordan says these potential reforms might include, here's some things we might do, broadening the statutory right of removal for certain criminal cases from state court to federal court. And this is a, a concept that exists. You can remove cases from a state level court up into a federal court. The local prosecution also raises concerns about conflicts of law, the supremacy of federal law to protect a former president and state level law to control his presence in the criminal justice system. It's a major conflict. This is why we've talked about, it's like dividing by zero. The committee may consider legislative reforms to address this. And in addition, they say that the DA's office out of New York has acknowledged Alvin has used federal forfeiture funds in its investigations of Trump, including when you were there, Mark Pomerantz, and during the time when Trump was a candidate for re-election. You were there. The committee may therefore consider legislation to enhance reporting requirements about the use of forfeiture funds and to prohibit the use of forfeiture funds to investigate current former presidents and presidential candidates. And Congress might also be able to restrict your jurisdiction's eligibility to even get federal funds in the first place. If these prosecutions are discriminatory on the basis of partisan affiliation or political beliefs. Now, this is a, an entire paragraph that is a, a supporting paragraph for basically Congress's jurisdiction. A lot of people are saying, what's the bait? How? What, what's, what is, how is it appropriate for Congress to come in here and interfere with state rights? I'm thinking to myself, these are Democrats? What are they talking about state rights? 
The J6 committee did this for two years. They were saying we have a basis to get anything we want because it could inform national security. This is about national elections. Trump is running for office and they're interfering with it by prosecuting him with a crime. Jordan says, maybe we shouldn't allow you to use funds. So Jordan continues, he says, based on your unique role as a special assistant leading the investigation into Trump, you, Mark, are uniquely situated to provide information that's relevant to our committee. And although the Bragg office has directed you not to cooperate with us, you have already discussed these topics in a book you published in February. And you also gave several interviews like on CBS or 60 Minutes, whatever that was. As a result, you have no basis at all to decline matters before the committee that you've already discussed in your book and on primetime television with an audience in the millions, including the basis of any purported duty of confidentiality or privilege. You already cracked the shell on this there, Mark. And your book discloses, says Jordan, various details about the Manhattan DA's investigation of Trump. It talks about internal deliberations about the investigation. You don't need to buy the book here. Jordan is going to summarize it for us. It's probably terrible anyways. Indeed, you discuss how members of the office viewed the credibility of a key witness in this case. Wow. And you note the concerns about the case's dim prospects. Wow. You thought it was a crap case there? You didn't say that on 60 Minutes there, Mark. For example, in your book, you recount, quote, a mini revolt that occurred following an internal office meeting in September. You offer details about a disagreement. Mark is in there. He's sitting there with Julieta Lozano. She works for the Major Crimes Division, and they're talking about Michael Cohen and his credibility. Mark and Julieta are like, well, I think he's probably pretty good. Now, you also complain about concerns expressed by Chris Conroy during another meeting. According to you, Conroy spoke about his misgivings. Oh, well, that sounds a little different because when Mark Pomerantz was on with 60 Minutes, it sounded like it was completely unanimous in his office. Everybody said this was obvious and we have to do it. Well, that's weird. Somebody named Conroy, Chris, apparently had misgivings. Maybe Julieta Lozano did too. Don't know. All stemming from a recent case involving accounting and fraud charges that mirrored the charges of President Trump. That case apparently also ended poorly for New York. And like Lozano, two people in your office, Lozano and Conroy, they express concerns about Cohen and his viability as a witness because he's a convicted perjurer, maybe. You accuse other lawyers of being relentlessly negative, dwelling on all the difficulties and issues with the case, and refusing to acknowledge the positives. Okay, so the whole office thinks this is a crap case, and Mark Pomerantz is just so TDS out of his mind, just jacked up on that stuff every morning, gets a fresh hit of it, and he is demanding you abide by what I think this case looks like. This is the disagreement. These are prosecutorial discretions. This case is weak as heck. But when he was doing his interview, he never made that known. Referring to your former colleagues as conscientious objectors, merely for opining about a weak case and pointing to its many fatal flaws. You ultimately dismiss their concerns about the investigation by suggesting that they were either too lazy to do the work, wow, or did not know the evidence, or they were somehow afraid of bringing the charges against President Trump. That's nice. Yeah, a bunch of ad hominems there from this prosecutor. This guy sounds like a typical prosecutor. Giant crybaby, going to do everything backwards to, to make the charges stick no matter what. And then when he doesn't get his way, calls everybody else lazy idiots for not knowing the evidence or wussies, too afraid to even bring the charges. This guy. <laughs> Your book described as a 300 page exercise in score settling and scorn, according to footnote 17, a review from Lloyd Green also reveals the extent to which the Manhattan DA's office appears to have been politically motivated in their prosecution. Jordan says, Mark, specifically, you describe your eagerness to investigate Trump willing and writing that you were, quote, delighted to join an unpaid group of lawyers advising on the Trump investigations. So for a full year, this guy drops everything and makes it his life work to go do this. And joking that salary negotiations had gone great because you would have paid to join the investigation. 
no, no, no. They don't need to pay me. I'll pay to join it. That's how much this dude hates Trump. You think I'm joking when I am I'm mocking these people for TDS. This guy would have paid. Now he's joking, but I don't, I don't think he's joking. What does it take for me to prosecute Trump? I want to be on the team. You frivolously compare President Trump to mob boss John Gotti. You claim the DA's office was warranted in throwing the book at him. You claim that you would become a master of breaking the law in ways that were difficult to reach. You explained that the collective weight of Trump's conduct over the years left no doubt in your mind that he deserved to be prosecuted. In other words, you seem, for reasons unrelated to the facts of this particular case, to be searching for any basis on which to bring criminal charges. 100%. This guy is dedicated to this, working for free a full year, would pay to get on the team. Now, although you were able to, according to you, quote, put aside your personal feelings during the investigation, your depth and your per personal animosity towards him is apparent. You wrote in the book, you said about Trump, I saw him as a malignant narcissist and perhaps even a megalomaniac who posed a real danger to the country and the ideals that matter to me. His behavior made me angry and even disgusted. Now, you additionally, Mark, marveled at the thought of being at the center of what might, what might be one of the most consequential criminal cases ever brought. You reflect on your only similar experience, which you indicated was the indictment of Osama bin Laden and other members of Al-Qaeda. So this, this could only reach the, the same threshold of 9-11 prosecutions. They really think this. They really think that Trump did the worst thing since the Civil War. That's in their language. That's not me being hyperbolic. Biden has said that. I'm pretty sure Kamala has said that. Kareem has said that. The worst thing since the Civil War. They skip over 9-11. They skip over Pearl Harbor. At least Mark was referencing Osama. Gosh, this could be even bigger than Osama prosecuting Trump for uh for for some for some spreadsheet problems. Drawing a parallel between the between these two items, vastly different matters, speaks volumes, Mark, about the mindset that you brought when you were investigating Trump. And so these perceptions appear to have colored your work as a special assistant. To the point where you even resigned because the investigation into Trump was not proceeding fast enough to your liking. In your resignation letter, Mark, you judged and prejudged the results of the investigation. You said Trump is guilty of numerous felony violations. You said, I'm not going to be a passive participant. And this was a grave failure of justice. Your public resignation reportedly left Alvin Bragg deeply stung. I told you he was not invited to happy hour. And we know he likes happy hour, man. Alvin goes for the two for ones big time and caused him to issue an unusual public statement emphasizing that the investigation into Trump was far from over. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to let me come. Let me come. Mark, your book also contributed to the political pressure on DA's office to bring the charges. And so for the foregoing reasons, in light of your disregard of our earlier voluntary request, please find attached a subpoena compelling your appearance for a deposition. Sincerely, your friend, Jim Jordan. Look forward to seeing you April 20th. Now that is the letter from Jim Jordan over to Mark Pomerantz, former New York prosecutor, obsessed with Donald Trump. Subpoena has been issued and delivered. And we'll see if Mark Pomerantz shows up or if he is referred over to the DOJ and held in contempt. Now, Alvin Bragg responded to this investigation. He posted this right after the House Judiciary Committee. They said, here's the subpoena and the cover letter over to Alvin, Alvin's former prosecutor, Pomerantz. You see the GOP posted that. And so then Alvin responded, oh, here's our response. And they did a little retweet with a statement. Here's what Alvin said. He said, the House GOP continues to attempt to undermine an active investigation, an ongoing New York criminal case with an unprecedented campaign of harassment and intimidation. 
Repeated efforts to weaken state and local law enforcement are an abuse of power that will not deter us. These elected officials would better serve their constituents and the country and fulfill their oath of office by doing their jobs in Congress and not intruding on the sovereignty ooh, of the state of New York by interfering in an ongoing criminal matter in the state. They're, they're, they're sovereign state rights peoples now. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> that's amazing. We love that. That's awesome. So interesting. Yeah, they're demanding Congress stay out of their affairs. Well, unfortunately, it's not how it works now. They started this game. They brought out the loser J6 illegally constituted committee that crapped all over those rules. And now it's their turn to be a part of the process. Shout out to Jim Jordan for sending subpoenas out to Mark Pomerantz. Hopefully Alvin Bragg is next and the rest of the DA's office. I think we should form a special select committee. In fact, it doesn't even need to be legally constituted. No reason for it at all. We'll continue to follow. Thank you for subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. Thank you for liking this video. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, my friends. Hey, shout out to Ray K in the house. Ray K gifted five memberships. Thank you to Ray K. Mad's got a gift. Welcome. We got Common Sense, Boiler Operator, One Nation Underground. We got Major DZ, Euro Wars. Courtesy of Ray K inviting people to our membership and our membership, our morning membership streams are getting amazing. And Hey, if you're on YouTube, don't, and you're a YouTube member, don't forget to grab the telegram group, come in and join us. If you got a gifted membership, come and join us on the telegram group. It is in the community post section. All right, my friends. And so thank you to Ray K. And also I saw that Tony Hay Munkets also became a member. Thank you, Tony. Hay. welcome. Welcome. And don't forget to grab the telegram. All right, my friends. And so we are carrying on because we have a doozy of a Proud Boys update indeed. Proud Boys trial continues. We learn there may be as many as 40 or more confidential human sources, informants, feds lurking around on January 6th. Now, yesterday when we left off on the trial, it was day 50 and day 51, and there were some questions about what was going on. A lot of sealed proceedings taking place under the dark of night. Jordan Fisher, Jordan on the record on Twitter, gave us an update. He said that the day before on day 50, Proud Boy trial went under seal for several hours. And they're going to go back under seal again on day 51. Judge Kelly denied a motion from the press. Even the press was demanding to get access to this. They said, can we see this, please? You can't just close these proceedings without giving us any notice and then do it again. And the judge said, sorry, you're not getting access to this. It is going to remain closed. And so we were sitting here wondering, going, what the heck? Why is the hearing so sealed? Well, maybe it had to do with confidential human sources. Maybe there were a bunch of agents that the judge didn't want us to hear about. And we wake up the following morning on day 52, and guess what is fresh on the docket? We have a new motion filed by Defendant Pozzola alleging big issues with the case. Here's what it says. Defendant Dominic Pozzola submits a motion to compel disclosure of all confidential human sources of Homeland Security. Not the FBI. We're normally screaming about them. Different agency because there are so many of them. Now, this was 11 pages of filings submitted 4523 out of the DC court, of course, the Proud Boys trial. Defense attorney Roger Roots is writing. He says, all right, everybody, comes now the defendant, Dominic, Proud Boy defendant, with a motion. We're asking the United States and the court to compel the prosecutors to reveal all informants, all undercover operatives, and all confidential human sources relating to the events of January 6th. Okay, all of them, every single one of them, not related to this case only, but all of them. Informants, paid or not, undercover operatives, CHSs, all of these people are not officially FBI or DHS agents. They're not on the payroll as employees, but they're still there. And we've been following them along throughout this entire case. Defense attorney says that Pozzola recently learned, maybe in one of these sealed hearings, that a federal agency other than the FBI called the Homeland Security Investigations Unit, his. 
which I think is an illegal pronoun for the federal government. They're probably going to have to fix that. Call it they. Was handling and running undercover CHSs on January 6th. And there are many other intelligence agencies. We've joked about how many different police departments there are in Washington, D.C., Capitol Hill Police, MPD. You know, the Mint has their own police department and all of these things. There's diff- Smithsonian, right? Hist- history, Smithsonian Police and all this stuff. So they're all there. And we're asking how many were involved. The federal prosecutors in this case, says the defense, are refusing to disclose information about these non-FBI informants because they're from a different entity, DHS. The existence and the conduct of these CHSs is almost certainly exculpatory for my client called Dominic Pizzola. Remember in the Proud Boys claim, it's about a conspiracy that they were going to take over the country. They were going to insurrect America. And if there's dozens of informants all over the place, how could that happen? Why did they allow it to happen? Why couldn't they stop it? Why did it get as far as it did if there are more informants than there are Proud Boys who were insurrectionists? Here's the background. From the defense, they write, The United States government has tortuously avoided disclosing the full scale of undercover confidential human sources among the Proud Boys on January 6. Government FBI witnesses first admitted that there was one confidential human source embedded among the Proud Boys on January 6. Just one. It might have been one. And then there were two. Then there were three. Then the government stipulated on April 4th that we read here that there were eight FBI confidential human sources among the Proud Boys. That's just one. That's just two. Now three. And we know that one of them, Kenny Lizardo, picked up Enrique Tario from jail on January, in January 4th or 5th, the day before this so called insurrection. We know that Jen Lowe was on payroll, was getting paid by the FBI. And according to the defense, was showing up at legal meetings and in prayer groups. On Friday, February, March 31st, federal prosecutors pulled defense counsel aside. End of the week, things are coming to a close. And they disclosed there were even more additional undercover officers belonging to Metro PD among the defendants on January 6th. Now, I want to be very specific about this. We are continually referring to the Proud Boys in this case because the Proud Boys are the people who are on trial right now. Eight among the Proud Boys. That's how I'm reading it. It's eight among the Proud Boys. I would imagine there's probably another eight among the Oath Keepers and probably another eight among the Three Percenters and probably another eight um, you know, all throughout the various entities that were there. They say that Pozzola, after learning about FBI and Metro and the one, two, and three, Pozzola has become aware that the largest numbers of undercover CHSs belong to agencies other than the FBI. We're all sitting here wondering about the FBI with their crayons playing Where's Waldo. But what about the other agencies? Defense says at least two law enforcement agencies each outnumbered the FBI teams in terms of running undercover agents, informants, and CHSs on January 6th. Two agencies had more than the FBI. First, the Metro Police had at least 13 undercover plainclothes agents among the Proud Boys and other Patriots on January 6th. 13. Next, there appear to have been some 19 confidential human sources belonging to an agency called HIS, Homeland Security Investigations. When added to the eight FBI confidential human sources now admitted by the prosecutors, this means that you add them all up, we have at least 40 undercover informants or agents doing surveillance among the defendants, the Proud Boys, on January 6th. 40 among the defendants of the Proud Boys. Remember, there are five Proud Boys on trial. There are 40 
undercover informants, Homeland Security, FBI, Metro Police, who knows who else, who are not being prosecuted. These are not FBI employees or agents. These are informants. These are people who are in the groups, hanging out with them, picking them up, taking them places. On Thursday, Pozzola filed a motion to serve witness Ray Epps. We read through that full filing here, if you missed that. Defendant contends that Mr. Epps is being suspiciously protected from prosecution by the government. You're kidding. Pozzola's motion included a paragraph addressing revelations by the J6 defendant, William Pope, in another case. Shout out to William Pope on Twitter, as I believe Free State will. I don't know if that's the same person, but shout out to William Pope. It says, undercover Metro police officers were among the crowd on January 6th, instigating the crowd to storm the Capitol. Metro police officers were among the crowd, instigating the crowd, not just standing there observing, instigating. The following day on Friday, March 31, in the middle of trial, Federal prosecutors in this case pulled defense lawyers aside and revealed that the United States came across, oh, we possess previously undisclosed information regarding the Metro PD officers working undercover on January 6th. In the middle of trial, near the end of trial, okay, we are on trial day 52 on this thing. They just pop it out. Oh, hey, by the way. You know, we're charging all five of your defendants with insurrecting America, with being a part of this massive conspiracy. And there are a bunch of MPD officers who are also instigating a lot of the other chaos that we're blaming your clients for. Specifically, there are previously undisclosed text messages between the undercover officers and Proud Boy supporters, which evidence very closely familial or intimate contact and relationships. Huh. Now, the information involved 12, now known to be 13, undercover or plainclothes officers from Metro amongst the demonstrators. Some of these undercover Metro officers marched with the Proud Boy March, and some appear have a, appear to have played roles of instigators and that they are seen on body-worn cameras. The police, the police are shouting this. Go, go, go. Stop the thing. Whose house? Our house. Whose house? Our house. Metro PD doing that. Others generally follow demonstrators towards the Capitol. Now, Pozzola submits that the entire defense in this trial, including opening cross and defense, would have been very different and much more aggressive if the defense attorneys had known the scope and the scale of the undercover government operations. Prosecutors made arguments contrary to information they possessed and withheld, and defense counsel could have lodged different cross-examinations and different examinations if they had known about these materials. Here's one example. This newly disclosed information supports Proud Boy assessment of Antifa prior to J6. The defense says that undercover Metro officers are seen on videos and private text messages remarking on the dangerousness of violence of Antifa. The Proud Boys were, were there. They had been attacked. Somebody had been stabbed. Somebody had been hit in the head, I think, in another ordeal. Prior to these revelations, prosecutors had painted the Proud Boys' statements about Antifa as exaggerated. They're just making it up. There's no Antifa there. A prosecution witness even said that. Prosecutors repeatedly suggested through their witnesses, through their chats, their texts, and their posts that Antifa were not defensive, but were secret Proud Boy code for creating violence. Yes. When the Proud Boys are saying, oh, no, we're here to fight back against Antifa. That's just secret code word insurrection language. We act in self-defense is translated to take the podium and seize the nuclear codes. 
That's what the government is alleging. Now, the government, they say, has withheld exculpatory information, information that might tend to show their innocence. With each bombshell, says the defense, the government generally begins its response to late disclosure complaints by saying the government was provided with the information, even if buried in the mountains of unnavigable discovery debris. They just throw it in there. But in this situation, the prior discovery dumps didn't provide all of the information. Buried in this discovery was a chart naming 12 Metro officers working for the unit on J6. But an additional 13th undercover Metro officer was revealed in recent revelations. And coincidentally, the 13th undercover officer appears to have been the most vociferous in promoting the storming of the Capitol. So the defense is saying, all right, look, judge, we didn't know about these people. Well, we kind of did. We knew a little bit about some of them. There was one chart in a big bin of discovery they dumped on our on our desk. And remember, they've done this before. Earlier in this trial, the prosecutors were going to use like three pages of, of, of a report. And they sent over 3,500 pages. And then when the defense complained about it, they said, well, we thought you were going to ask for more. So we just gave you a ton. Right? They're being jerks. They're being cheaters because that's largely what government does is cheat, especially in J6 cases. And so here, they do disclose some people, but 12 are known officially. The 13th is disclosed late. They go through the 13th. That's the most aggressive person in the crowd. Weird how they left that 13th person out. So they say the material rebuts significant portions of other motive evidence that the government was permitted to present. We objected to that. They were still allowed to run with it. It confirms the reality of law enforcement concerns over Antifa. It it provides percipient evidence that Antifa was engaged in the exact sort of violence that they're calling the Proud Boys responsible for. If counsel had this material in possession, we would have done different cross-examinations. And given the nature of this case, this material is exculpatory and relevant. Now, the defense continues, they write, we are entitled to know every single HSI human source who was there. The defense recently became aware that another agency called the Homeland Security Investigations Unit was also handling more CHSs on J6 than the FBI. The startling case of the J6 defendant, Jeremy Brown, brought the existence of these informants to light. In the days before J6, Homeland Security handlers visited Brown's residence and they attempted to recruit Brown into becoming a paid source for HSI. Brown recorded the would-be handlers attempt to recruit him. And in the video, the handlers, these two guys, Brett Lindsay and Paul Ura, indicated that they were making 19 additional stops that day. So they go over to Brown Hey, you want to join us and become a Fed? He's recording the whole thing. He's like, wow, wow, why are you coming to me? We're going to everybody today. We got 19 stops. It seems obvious, according to that, that the agents were planning on making similar recruitment contacts to get 19 other sources. Now, they say that specific note here, it seems that the Justice Department is retaliating against Brown for refusing his offer They charged him with crimes. He says, I'm not going to work with you losers. I'm not going to be a fed for you. I'm not a snitch. Get out of here. They said, fine, we'll just charge you with crimes because we're the rotten government. Prosecutors in this case say they have no duty to provide the CHS from prosecutors say we don't have to give you anything from anybody else other than the FBI. (laughs) Oh my God. So they asked for this on April 4th. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ballantine responded to lawyer for the defense, Roger Roots' email. Roger sends an email and says, hey, I'd like some more information about all of these sources. And the prosecutor responds. She says, a dear defense attorney Roots. Now, I don't know whether the name redacted or Oath Keeper Jeremy Brown or sources for another agency. She said, I don't know. I don't even know. But even even if they were, I don't see how that fact would be relevant here. Homeland Security, and I'm not even sure specifically what that would be, is not the investigative agency in this case. 
So I understand the relevance of your CHS theory and that if there was a plan, then the FBI CHSs would have reported the existence of the plan and they did not report a plan and therefore there was no plan. But what is the relevance of this person's status as a source to another agency? Well, it's the same relevance there. Valentine, if they didn't report it, to the FBI that there was no insurrectionary plan, all 40 of them, no, no, no 40 of them reported there was a plan. We'd like to know if their other agencies also got those same reports. Well, what does it have to do with it? They didn't tell the FBI agents and handlers about it. So who cares what they told Homeland Security? What's the relevance? Roger says, of course, these proclamations violate the government's obligations under Brady and its progeny saying you don't need it, they're not investigating this. Okay, well, we don't care. You don't have an obligation only to disclose exculpatory material from whatever cases you choose, from whatever agencies you choose. If it's within the, if it's within the power of the government, you've got an obligation to give that to us because we don't have the, uh, the power of the government. We don't know as defendants, as innocent citizens with the presumption of innocence, what is going on. We can't see if there's HSI or Metro PD or Capitol Hill PD or FBI, all of them. We don't get to see it. So you've got an obligation to tell us this stuff. And if you're alleging there's a conspiracy, there's a common scheme or plan, all of these people are in cahoots to do this together. Why didn't any of them report to any of their handlers that there was in fact a plan? And shouldn't we be allowed to present that evidence? But this prosecutor, I don't understand the relevance of it. Why is it, why is it appropriate? Now, Brady and its obligations do not extend to the entirety of the government. They do include any and all investigative agencies who worked on the case, related, who knew or who should have known that information would be material to a prosecution arriving from their direct involvement. If other federal agents were there on January 6, all of those agencies should be absolutely relevant. It's the same event. The Capitol Police are directly related and fully aware of the events. Capitol Police is an agency of Congress. Capitol Police and Congress are two primary alleged victims, and the Capitol Police is the primary investigative agency in terms of immediacy and geographic proximity. Most of the witnesses and the investigators from the FBI have no firsthand knowledge of the events. They're merely reviewing reports. Here is the original email by Roger Roots. He says, hey, Jocelyn, Prosecutor Ballantine, we're still following up on this person. Who is this person? We have two witnesses who absolutely insist that Proud Boy Redacted made suspicious calls on January 6th. We want to know about this. The name called one individual named Brett by mistake, wrong number, and then made statements consistent with being a source awaiting instructions to engage activities at the Capitol. Whoa. Roger Root says, we have a witness who says somebody made a call. Looks like that wit that person is a source awaiting instructions to engage in activities at the Capitol. Wait, what, just, they're getting waiting for the text message. It's execute order 66, go. Note that the name Brett is shared by a Homeland Security agent who seemed to be running sources on January 6th. Weird. One agent, one person, agent named Brett running sources. And phone calls are being made. Roger says, the case of Jeremy Brown in Tampa involves a Homeland Security agent named Brett. As you know, Homeland went and the FBI went to Brown's house and he refused to become a source. So this begs the question, even if this person was not an FBI source, was he Homeland Security source? Same question regarding Ray Epps. Was Ray Epps a Homeland Security source? We've been saying FBI and they keep saying, no, he's not an FBI source. Was he a Homeland Security source? And is that how they're skipping over this whole thing? And of course she responded, I don't see the relevance. What does it have to do with anything? Who cares if it's HSI? 
they're not related to this. FBI is in charge of this case and it's their jurisdiction. And so stay out of it. Don't ask about other agencies. And he says, well, other agencies who were investigating this case and had agents there, they're kind of relevant to my case. Roger Roots, the defense continues. The city of DC police had undercover officers on the scene of the Capitol in the early afternoon. They were on standby under memoranda of understanding to respond to the police. He says, plainly under Brady, the government prosecutors are obligated to give us the identities of them. Supreme Court said so. Brady material is exculpatory information material to a defendant's guilt, which the government knew about but failed to disclose to the defendant in time for trial. We're in the middle of trial. They knew about all of these sources, all 40 plus of them, and they didn't disclose them. Brady requires this disclosure. And they didn't do it. More case law here. We'll fast forward. All citing from Robinson and others. In conclusion, Root says, the United States is refusing to provide information, which obviously has a high likelihood of being exculpatory. Under the most foundational principles of Brady, our defendants are entitled to this information. And so accordingly, our client Dominic asks for an order compelling, compelling the United States to give us the names, the identities, the reports of all the Homeland Security investigation CHSs operating at or near the Capitol around the Proud Boys on January 6th. Great motion, shocking motion. Roger Roots, Esquire, co-counsel for defendant Pozzola, signed, sent this in April 5th. Maybe not that shocking at all. We've all suspected that there were dozens of feds. We might be getting into the hundreds of feds. We might get into triple digits of feds. If there were 40 people that the defense has been able to eyeball without the government even being transparent about it, this is just them picking them out of the wilderness, identifying them. The government hasn't even disclosed them. So maybe 40 times the Proud Boys, 40 times the Oath Keepers, another 40 times all of the other groups who were there. Fed surrection, indeed. So this was the original motion. The government, of course, will respond to that. But the takeaway, at least 40 agents, 40 informants, 40 individuals who the government knew about, who were embedded with these so-called insurrectionists, none of whom ever reported that there was a common scheme or plan. There was never any conspiracy to take over the Capitol. 40 agents. Now, we've made a big stink here about how many charges there are or how many lack of charges there are in the J6 cases. Kyle Cheney from Politico posted this one today, gave us a quick summary. Remember, 1,000 people were charged. Only 339 of those 1,000 were assaulting or impeding police, which is basically a joke charge. 107 of those were with a dangerous weapon. We've gone through the funnel of these numbers before. 107 charged with a dangerous weapon. Many of those dangerous weapons were water bottles and flagpoles and other things like that. So it's about 107 and we've got about 40 undercover CHSs who were there. You see those numbers? Now, 533 have pled guilty, 83 found guilty at trial, which means half the cases are closed and already sentenced. 453 have already been sentenced. So our whole useless Department of Justice is spending millions and billions of dollars and wasting all of these efforts for give or take about 500 open cases. A small percentage of those are actual violent or assault types of crimes. And as we know, a big portion of those cases, many of them being prosecuted, were probably inundated with feds, CHSs, and others everywhere. This whole thing is like a drop in the bucket. A thousand charges for two coming on three years of prosecutions is nuts. And half of them were feds. That is what's going on in the Proud Boys trial before we even start the day. Then we turn our attention to Proud Boys trial, day 52. With all of that out of the way, Brandy Buckman is reporting on the trial and she is at Brandy Buckman on Twitter. And you can follow her at Brandy underscore Buckman. 
trial is in session. Judge Kelly's back on the bench. All rise. Please be seated. All right, everybody, before we turn uh, to the last 15 or so pages of jury instructions, a few housekeeping points. Now, we're going to skip over any jury instructions here, just as a reminder. And I don't think I explained this well yesterday. When you go through jury instructions, you're literally reading through sentences and arguing over words. It's like editing a Word document with five or six people in the room and a judge arguing over sentences. So for that part of this review, we'll fast forward through all of it because it's just painful. And we'll take a look at the jury instructions when they are finalized, once the final document is edited and we can pull it up on the screen. But before we get into that, a couple of housekeeping points from Judge Kelly. He says, all right, I want to thank the defense attorneys for teeing up these Enrique Tario exhibits. I am anticipating that there's going to be very ar various arguments about this. And so here's where we stand. He says, look, I am going to exclude the expert testimony of Metcalf wanted in yesterday for relevance and 403 grounds. So we're not going to have the expert witness who is going to come talk about police and circles and how this whole thing went down. Kelly, he says, well, you know, if we brought in that expert witness and gave the defense an opportunity to explain how this works, it's going to be difficult for the jury. You know, even if there is some relevance to it, it just seems to pull it apart from the defense theory of self-defense. And so we're just not going to do it. He says, well, we agreed to putting on Mr. Hill, not trying to qualify him as an expert. He says, we also had Ms. Harris this week. Now, Kelly, before the jury is brought in, he says, we had Miss Harris, the clerk. She brought up an issue about juror availability. And apparently a juror informed the clerk that he had a business-related trip that he's going to be out on Thursday and Friday. Well, the judge better tell him no, he's not going anywhere. He says, I'm letting you all know that, and you all can think about what to do about that. And we don't have a ton necessarily to decide here. We can decide that later, you know, if we want to take those days off or whatever. If those two days we don't have a full jury, we either plan around it or the other possibility, I can see if there's any legal room, how we can complete this. Maybe I can see if he can just complete it. Is he required to do this? I'll just tell him, you know, he, you're not going. Just tell your boss the judge said you're not going. This is the Proud Boys trial, okay? I need you to convict these people. Tell them. So Hernandez raises her hand. She's a defense attorney representing Zachary Real. She says, Your Honor, you know, we had a bunch of sealed matters yesterday that we've been hashing through, and I think it makes sense to keep this juror until we resolve those things. Yeah, I don't, the judge says, I don't care. Prosecutors, what do you say? He said, We're kind of processing at the moment. They're all flipping through their papers, but we're inclined to indicate to the juror that we're at a point where we're close to closing arguments, and we want to see whether that juror can just make some adjustments. I'm not sure what we want to do yet, but we may just tell him you're not going on your trip. I think we're prepared to proceed. That's where we're at. Now, he says, Your Honor, the government has two Metro police officers here whose reporting was disclosed to the defense last week or so. They were on ground during the rallies in November and December, and they observed and recorded videos. Prosecutor says, I know certain defendants are interested in calling these officers, but there's been talk about a stipulation about issues and whether the jury could resolve this stuff. He says, I think all of it's excludable under the rule 403, more probative than prejudicial, because the testimony would seek to relate crimes and violence committed by anonymous Antifa members, right? So the defense wants to bring in Metro PD police to ask about Antifa. And the government says, ah, oh, we shouldn't ask about Antifa because they're just anonymous. And it's outside the scope. It's too far removed from any of this. They're charged with crimes, not Antifa. They bring up the November and December rallies. Talking about the motive and the intent of those rallies. And they're still hashing over this witness. The defense attorney jumps up. He says, well, we did have an officer with Antifa. And they could be put forward. And if they want, they could put on a rebuttal case. Judge says, well, it is relevant. The evidence of some of these other rallies are relevant. 
but I didn't let in some of the other post-election rallies, so maybe I'm not going to let in the other rallies. On the other hand, the judge says, we might be able to get the evidence in through direct and cross and just kind of see what happens. Who was looking for trouble with whom? He says, he's given us a big explanation. Part of the evidence we have, he says, is from the radios, from communications. In some cases, we had body armor and other things like that. Part of the evidence you've elicited through your own witnesses and the cross of the government is no, no. We had that because we took what happened with Mr. Mr. Bertino and attempted to bring order out of chaos. He says, I think, I can't say the elements is irrelevant, but if you want to put on a limited show, I think you can do that. So they're still going through some preliminary matters, and I want to get to the witnesses. Okay, here it is. Now, this is what we're talking about now. Roger Roots comes in, and we just read through the motion with 40-plus confidential human sources. Judge Kelly says, oh, hey, Roger Roots, I think you filed something minutes before I took the bench, so I'm not going to burn any time on it this morning. He says, Judge, well, it's kind of an important issue, you know. There's an agency of the federal government that had more CHSs than the FBI. That's why I filed it. It's kind of a big issue. He says, yeah, I saw your motion. I saw your motion. I'll say this. There's a lot of things in it that seem like they are internally, factually inconsistent. You, can you believe this, Judge? <laughs> I saw your motion. I saw your motion. He just said I didn't read it. I think you filed something before the bench. I'm not going to burn any time on it this morning. He says, well, there's about 40 informants in our case. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. I'll say this. Look, there's a couple things in it. It doesn't really seem factually consistent for me. And there's a lot of things that you leap from thing to thing in a way that I'm not sure is warranted. You just keep bringing up these people. And Root says, well, I want to make a statement on the record. Okay, I filed my motion. And if you're not, you know, before we begin, I want to just make a statement on the record. We're on recording. I want to make a statement. Judge Kelly says, no, he says, no, we're not going to do things like that. We're going to do the things that we're prepared to do today. The government's going to respond to your motion. We're not hearing your argument on the sources. Prosecutor Ballantine says, well, maybe Sunday I could give a response by Sunday. Judge Kelly says, no, that's Easter Monday. You guys have Monday respond by Monday to your source motion. Now we get back to the jury instructions which they say they should complete today. And we're going to fast forward through the jury instructions. Talking about intent. You can see, you can see how difficult this is to follow because they're raising the issue of 15112E. And that's written into the statute as an affirmative defense. I note one, right? And they're talking through all the different elements of the statutes. So let's see if we have any other witnesses today. Ten minute break. Good progress. Kelly says he's going to circulate draft jury instructions to the parties. A few items are going to be bracketed. Good progress. Great. All right. That's good. Jury instructions are just a pain and boring and terrible. They take a 10 minute break and we're back. Oop, spoke too soon. Technical problem. And now we're back. Now we have another witness. The defense calls Stephen K. Hill for Dominic Pozzola. Hill takes the stand. He's an older gentleman, quite tall and thin, very neatly shorn, gray hair and beard, dark suit jacket, light dress, shirt and tie. Hey, Stephen, thanks for being here today. Can you tell me, what do you do about uh, for work? He says, oh, I'm retired. Well, what'd you do before you retired? Well, I started my career in the Air Force. I was a law enforcement specialist. I was in a position for about six years. Then I became a police officer for the Albuquerque Police Department. I was there for about 19 years until I retired. Probably a very good witness on the stand. Probably testifies very well. And now after you retired, Stephen, what happened next? You became a training instructor? He says, well, I've always been a training instructor. I was hired by Sandy International Laboratories where they hired me to be a lieutenant for a training program. It covered about everything. I certified firearms, less than lethal weapon systems, use of force, and just about everything else. The main reason they hired me was for my expertise in a hostage rescue. I have a lot of experience with it. So I went to DOE to train 
and I've trained hundreds of police officers on how to protect vulnerable, high-risk materials or people. Now, Metcalf shows Hill a picture of a V100 armored vehicle from the Albuquerque Police Department. It's up on the screen. He says, what is this? You were with the SWAT team? Prosecutors are objecting. Objection, Judge. What is this vehicle? Relevance, 403. Judge says it's overruled. Hill describes the photo. He says, yeah, that was our tactical team. It was the SWAT team and I. We would park this vehicle up at a park, and that's me right there in front. It was about 1997. And they say, well, Mr. Hill, you spent a lot of time looking at footage from January 6th. Is that true? He says, yeah, a lot of time. I want to play one clip from this. Tell me if you recognize it. It'll be a little bit less than a minute, and then I'll ask you another question, okay? Plays the video. Footage is from outside the Capitol. Defense is trying to show that Pozzola just got caught up in a little bit of a mess. It was just chaos. Rioters are scaling scaffolding. Police are outnumbered. Metcalf asks Hill to explain what he's seeing. Hill says, well, here we have uniformed officers, standard patrol officers. After a couple of moments with people yelling, you see a hard squad, a kind of a skirmish line. Officers and heavier protective materials, they line up. There's a line of officers behind the line. And the defense says, is there a line of officers after the skirmish line? He says, yeah, they are. We call them linebackers. Basically a handful of different officers in a leadership role. They're there to keep the skirmish line straight and make sure nobody gets in between it. Prosecutor says, your honor, objection to this. Husher is off, proceedings resume. Defense says, now, Mr. Hill, can you explain to me a little bit about what is on this screen? Another sidebar, more footage. He says, who is this person on this video? He says, oh, that's a commander. That's a police officer. And what does that mean? Well, this is what he does for the department. Now he's trying to get an attention. Who is this guy? What is he doing? He says, that gentleman is trying to get the, the attention of a team of officers. What is that officer doing? He's giving a physical circle, the wagons gesture to get someone's attention and pointing at the crowd. So he's making some hand gestures in the video. He says, who's this person? That's Pozzola, Dominic Pozzola, Proud Boy defendant. He's in the footage now in the middle of a thick crowd of people. Officers are trying to keep people back. Defense says, who is this person? He says, that's another officer who's on the ledge. Plays the video forward. He says, who's that? That's another officer at the top of a stairwell. Who's this? That's another officer near the scaffolding. And who's that? How many officers are total there, Hill? He says about three or four in the area. Now, there's another man making gestures. Who is that? He says, that's Inspector Lloyd. And he's pointing at the officers? Yeah, directly at him. He says one officer has his shield up between the crowd and himself. He's using it to ensure no one throws anything at him. Now, what about the officers next to him? She has a less than lethal weapon. He uses some technical name. Is that like similar to a rifle? He says, yeah, but less than lethal. Now, there's another commanding officer standing in the group. They play the video forward. And then by about one, Hill says, now we're prepared to shoot less. They prepared to shoot less than lethal rounds. Camera pans from the crowd. Screen is flicking off officers screaming, F you. Hill says the crowd was angry, very pissed. And after officers fired less than lethal rounds into the crowd, the crowd got animated, right? Very angry. They're standing around. Cops start firing off projectiles. They start getting angry. Hill says a man named Joshua Black is hit in the face. Now the crowd, according to Metcalf, he's trying to make the argument. They got whipped into a frenzy. The police started it. The crowd was standing around until they started lobbing off projectiles. Hill's sitting there testifying. He says, yeah, the crowd is yelling. Says they show they shot him in the effing face. They just shot him in the effing face. And now the jury sees the footage. Blood is on the pavement. Black is spitting blood into a water bottle as a woman washes his face off. Woman identifies herself as medically trained. The video continues. Black is seen. MAGA hat on head. Camo, camo hoodie on. Gloves, sunglasses clutching his face, shot by the cops. 
the fence says, who's this person helping him clean his face off? He says, that's Ryan Samsel. The video plays forward. The crowd around him is screaming at an officer. Hill says, you'll notice that one gentleman puts rubber gloves on. He's trying to put gauze inside of Black's mouth while he's going in there. Looks like he's trying to remove the munition in there. Jury sees a photo of Black with a less than lethal munition, went through his cheek, punched a hole into his mouth, and people around him are trying to stop the bleeding on sight. Metcalf says, so the crowd looks a little riled up now. Objection leading. He says, okay, how about this? Explain what the crowd was doing. He says, yeah, they're angry, upset. They're pissed. One of their own had just been shot in the face. Objection, foundation overruled. Prosecutors are getting angry about this. They're objecting at everything. They're just sitting there, all four of them, object, getting ready to go. Hill says, yeah, he'd been shot by a less than lethal munition. Penetrated his cheek, the side of his mouth, and it did an awful lot of damage. A hard squad officer, says Hill, as the footage played, tried to take Black back into custody. Inspector Lloyd, earlier seen further back, is now in the crowd. Hill says that this is when they tried to bring Black in. Footage is playing forward, officers talking to Black, nodding with a hand on his shoulder. Hill says this was the officer's mistake because it upsets the crowd. You're not taking him, they said. He's one of ours. The video shows rioters then clashing with the police. Violent skirmish breaks out around Black in the crowd. Cops come to take the guy they just shot. Hill says, here at least two Capitol Police officers are on the ground, and Pozzola is also on the ground in his back. Defense attorney asks, so at this time, does Pozzola have his hands on that shield? So I'm not sure if he has his hands on this shield. Now, I want to play another video for you. This time, it's around the same time frame, but from a different angle. Slow down a little bit. Not exactly easy to make the details out. Crowd is thick. Flags are blocking. Projectiles are flying by. Metcalf says, this is a vantage point I want to show you. Officers are standing here above the crowd, right? Now, the projectile that flies off one strikes a gentleman in the face, right in the ear area, is what Hill says. The video plays forward, Hill's describing. He says that the same man is hit in the back of the neck, is struck somewhere in the chest with a 303 round. More footage is played. Another close-up, a warning sign. Less than lethal launcher used by police. He says, what does the warning label say? He says, don't aim at the heads or chests of people. But where was he shot? In the face? Yeah, okay. Now, we went through a similar line of arguments in the Oath Keepers trial. Prosecutors argued cops wouldn't have had to do this if you weren't insurrecting anything. The old chicken or the egg argument. Maybe there wouldn't have been an insurrection if you didn't file or, or maybe there wouldn't have been a riot if you weren't lobbing projectiles into a crowd and then trying to take people who you shot in the face. In the next clip, Hill says Lloyd is using the circle the wagons gesture to get officers situated above the growl, crowd to fire down. Objection, foundation, probably calls for speculation. You don't know what the officers are doing. Cop, cops may have been shooting down, but you can't prove that, so the objection is sustained. Witness Hill says Lloyd is looking up at the team, holding the less than lethal weapons. Defense plays the video, says, listen to the sound in this video and tell me what you hear. They're screaming and yelling in the video. Hill says, I hear something. Someone is saying something at the same level of the camera. Whoever he says is, it's directing the targeting of people at the bottom. It's identifying the description of an individual, telling a person with less than lethal to engage them. He says, do you hear that? He says, yeah. The prosecutor just objected to this, arguing to shoot down on the crowd. You haven't proven that. So he's walking him through it. Did you hear what they said? He said, yeah, I did. It said, target the people at the bottom. Use less than lethal to engage them. You heard that, right? Yeah. And after you heard that message, did you hear any shots go off? Hill says, former police officer, says, you hear, yeah, you hear pop, pop, pop of shots. And then you hear someone say, boom, 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 as rounds impact. So the cop is shooting. Pop, pop, pop. It hits. And he says, 
Boom, boom, boom. Got him. Boom, boom, boom. Got him. Shooting from the top. Boom, boom, boom. Now I can hear thwunk of munitions. And she's having a difficult time hearing some of the video because it is in, she's in the media room. They break for lunch. And they come back. Back in the Proud Boys trial. And of course, it's back under seal. Once they return from lunch. Back under seal with nobody. Is seeing what's happening. Now, apparently, Pozzola has a give, send, go, raising money. So shout out to Pozzola. If you want to go find a give, send, go, you can help support his legal funds. The courtroom is unsealed again. Public sessions back in. Direct examination of Hill continues. Defense attorney says, all right, Mr. Hill. Now, this is going to be quick. I want to focus on one man who is hit by what you said was a pepper ball. He circles a person on the screen, standing near an area. What happened with this guy? He says, yeah, this man is someone who was wounded with a less than lethal hit him. He says, so I want to do a compare and contrast with you, Mr. Hill. You've compared and contrasted these videos, and you've looked at this scene from very different angles. And so I want to start with a signal where Lloyd gave, and what do you see? He says, you're seeing a crowd pushing against officers and officers pushing back. The officers are doing a good job. And he says, well, you know, you're, you're not qualified as an expert. Even, you, you know, he has a lot of expertise. He's still not doing a lot. He's still not qualified as an expert on this topic. So he says, without giving your opinion, he, he fixes it. He knows what's going on. He says, well, you can see it's a shoving match in the scene. He says, no one's punching anyone anywhere. And now after the circle wagons signal is given hill says you can see less than lethal launched into the crowd and within a few minutes the crowd gets angrier and angrier okay so we see this change the crowd is pushing against the officers officers are pushing back it's a shoving match in the scene but no one is punching anything then cops start firing stuff into the crowd crowd gets angrier and angrier and this leads to Joshua Black getting shot in the face. Circle the wagon, signal is given. Cops, plunk, 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 boom, boom, boom. It comes firing down. The crowd gets angry. That led to Joshua Black getting shot in the face? He says, yeah, you can hear 10 shots in the video. One of them have high decibel. One person has high decibel hearing loss. He pulls up another video. Plays it back. Can you hear those shots? Yes, I can hear them. Before the shots, I can hear someone in the background calling in the shot. The voice says, gray hair. And then he saw a shot. Another shot into the crowd. And then this happens four or five times. Somebody's up there yelling, gray hair, black hat, something over here. And they're just taking them out. Plunk, boom. Boom. Black is visible after being shot. Metcalf says that less than a minute after the signal from Lloyd, there's more than 10 munitions shot into the crowd as somebody's calling him out. He says that five or six people were shot in the face and in this area, it's the same area. Same place that Pozzola came into possession of the shield. So Pozzola grabs the shield, not because he's going to go insurrect the Capitol, but because the cops are shooting projectiles into the faces of, at this time, peaceful protesters who were just standing around on the grounds. Under 30 seconds, he grabs a shield very fast. No further questions. Prosecutor takes the stand, conducting the cross-examination. He says, all right, Mr. Hill, help now. When you were a, an officer in law enforcement, part of your duties included protecting high-risk people. Is that right? Yeah, he said high-risk articles and people. So people who, because of their position, are targeted. Is that true? Yeah. And those high-level targets had experience protecting. 
but they would be individuals like the vice president or members of Congress, right? Yeah. And you understand prior to the videos being shown today that rioters use force to make their way onto restricted grounds. Objection, scope. Kelly says, okay, for now, I'll let you get into it. He says, now you understand that a number of different things happened prior to the events in the videos that you saw today, right? Yeah. And the video you saw earlier, it's from a vantage point that was looking down on the plaza. Was it your position that it was impossible for members of that crowd to turn around and leave? Objection. Sidebar over. Prosecutor is corrected. He comes back. Now, these people are facing towards the Capitol building, and they're not facing the other way as if to leave. Is that true? Yes. So they play the video again. Not much stopping this time. Rioters are screaming, shoving fingers in their face. He says, how many rioters are here? Well, in the video, there's about 500. And how many officers? About 50 or 60. So they were pretty badly outnumbered, right? Yeah, they were pretty badly outnumbered. Because for some bizarre reason, all of the security at the Capitol was rejected. Mayor Muriel Bowser rejected it in a letter. Trump said, we'll send the National Guard in to take some control of this. She said, no. Capitol Hill Chief of Police Stephen Sun said, we might need some more support. Sergeant at Arms said, no. Only 50 or 60 people for a, a estimated 100,000 plus crowd? And Nancy Pelosi said, we've been waiting for this. Now, badly outnumbered, Hill agrees when asked, yeah, people were very angry. And this was before Joshua was hit with ammunition. Yeah, they were angry, but not like after he got shot in the face. Okay, they were they were upset and protesting and rioting, but it was a different situation. Now, jurors hear a radio transmission, officers sending calls to the crowd. He says, they weren't firing indiscriminately into the crowd, were they? He says, no, they were selecting three individuals and just shooting them. Nothing in the video suggests that the officers were firing at random though, right? Right. And there's no way to tell in the video what part of the body the officers are aiming at. He says, yeah, that's true. You can only see where they're hitting. There's no, la no laser designator. Correct. They're just shooting it. It's hitting them in the heads. So now the crowd is facing the, towards the officers, right? Toward the Capitol. Yeah. The majority are looking at the skirmish line. Several others are looking up at the less than lethal team above them. Prosecutor says, I want to bring this video up and show you what is here. It's the video where Joshua Black is hit in the cheek. He says the, the crowd is already clashing with the police, right? And, and he hasn't been shot yet, right? Yes, it's not happened yet. And the crowd's getting pretty forceful with officers. He says, yeah, there's a lot of pushing and yelling. That's right. And you understand in the layout of the scene that these officers are separating the crowd for the Capitol? He says, yeah, that's the purpose of the skirmish line. Now, there's a man at the skirmish line hosting a large flag on the video. He's hit with ammunition and he falls back. Hill says, "It, yeah, it had to have hurt. And Mulrow says, yeah, that's the purpose of the projectile. It's to deter people. So another man in the same video same time frame, same location. He's hit twice and he continues to advance. Plays the video again, drawing attention to a man who's hit in the brim of the hat with a beige jacket. Hill says, yeah, by the face. Yeah, hit at the brim of the hat by the face. And he moved away, right? Yeah. I want to play another video. And the it, it's a transmission from the police. They're saying, they're throwing poles. I have less than lethal target. The base of the subject, baseball hat and axe handle, and the subject with the gas mask in an American short, American flag. He's assaulting an officer now. Right, yeah, they had uh, baseball hats, axe handles, and flagpoles. These were all the violent weapons, axe handles, and, and wa water bottles also. So the prosecutor says, you see the man grabbing an officer by the throat? Is he wearing an American flag and a gas mask? Yeah. And it's here we see Pozzola jump into the fray and grab the shield? He says, yeah, I see him in the fray. He's bringing himself there though, right? Objection. He's coming into the crowd. He's not being shoved from behind. He says, well, I don't know. A lot of people are being pushed from behind. So I don't know. You see camera crews trying to get in there. They are diving in for a great shot. I don't know what it is, Hill says. Everybody's pouring into the building, taking photographs. And those people didn't get charged. 
Now, more police radio transmission is played. Jurors hear officers send up warning that rioters are not backing down, not stopping the assault. So it's a bunch of cops, you know, we're under attack, man. They're killing us all. We're all dying here. And they just play it over and over and over because why not? Now the prosecutor asks about the police, the people giving care to Josh, Joshua Black, who got shot in the face. He says people further back in the crowd, they can't see the extent of this injury, right? So like they can't get mad because of this shot in the face. They didn't know about it. He says the people giving him care are not flying into a rage, stealing shields, are they? He says, no, these guys stop what they're doing. There's a lull in the action and they're rendering aid for a gunshot wound and they're doing a pretty good job. They play another video. Officers in riot gear crouching down with black after he's injured. The officers in hard riot gear has his hand on the man's shoulder and they're talking. They say, Hill, have you ever given medical aid before? He says, yeah. He says, so they're talking and black backs away from the officer. Ryan Samsel steps back between Black and the officer, and people start shouting. He's one of ours. The officer grabbed Black's collar, pulled toward the police line, Hill says. So he's grabbing him. You're coming with us. Prosecutor says, well, if they were attempting to arrest Mr. Black, that would be interference with his arrest, wouldn't it? Objection sustained. I think they used the phrase an awful lot of damage to describe his injury, right? Yeah. And he says that Josh didn't even leave the Capitol after this, did he? Says, no, he stayed at the Capitol for some time. He's clutching his cheek and he's talking to somebody filming, still on Capitol grounds. Now, prosecutor continues, shows a picture of Joshua Black inside the Capitol after he's been shot in the mouth. Says he's right inside the Capitol, isn't he? On the Senate floor? Yeah, that's correct. So this is in attempting to show that this being shot in the face thing is not so dramatic. Okay, he got shot in the cheek. He's still there in the Capitol building. So the defense attorney comes back up and continues with a redirect. And says, Mr. Hill, do you recall seeing Pozzola touching his head, feeling his head like he's been hit? You've seen a video of an interaction where Pozzola got a shield? Yeah. And you reviewed these things frame by frame? Yeah. Do you recall seeing Pozzola looking down after blood was on the floor? Yeah. Do you recall seeing Pozzola ducking down? He says, yeah. I want to show you this video with Ryan Samsel. That's the man who put his arm between the officer and Black? Yeah. And what did the officers do when the officers picked up Black? He stepped in between them. And what did people do around them? Well, they're trying to pull Black away from the officer. Brief sidebar. Now, this video is super slow-mo. Can you ID my client, Dominic Pozzola, here? He says, yeah, I can. And what's he doing? He says, first, he covers his head. He's ducking as if he's protecting his head with his hands. More footage is played. Slow-mo. He stops it. He says, what happened right here? What are people doing? He says some people are looking up at the officers above them as they prepare to fire munitions. It's like the Boston Tea Party, man. They're sitting there. And the police are down upon them preparing to unload. Defense says, should it matter if a couple of shots were good or bad? Objection sustained. No further questions. Now, the jurors are excused. Judge Kelly says, before we break uh, attorneys, jurors, you're free to go. Thanks for your attention. We do want to get to the Tario law enforcement exhibits. Defense attorney Jaraguay for Enrique explains, we're ready to go. Judge, if you'll allow it, I'll make a brief argument for something that you ruled out earlier, but we're ready. Kelly says, now, I want to talk about scheduling. How much time do we have left? He says, how long will the reading of exhibits take? He says, I don't know, about 30, 35 minutes, depending on how many you allow in. 40, 45, maybe? A minute per exhibit? We got 46 exhibits, so how much? Judge says, are we getting to Kel Tar Carmen Hernandez's investigator today? Well, I think we could. He says, well, I know we have a hard out today at 5 p.m., but let's get as far as we can. Carmen says, my witness has been here all afternoon. 
Kelly's looking at the prosecutor's table. They talk about three exhibits now for Shane Lamond, a suspended police officer. Multiple layers of hearsay are being argued. Kelly will let Tario's team admit other exhibits, actually, most of them. And now they're talking about scheduling. Can we be done by the 17th? Well, there's a big difference here. Talking about reading exhibits. Tario's intern is very smiley. Wow, big day in court. Interns having fun. Shout out to Enrique Tario's intern. Doing a great job. Shout out to the defense interns out there. Prosecutor interns. Pff, have a nice life. Brandy says, as she continues, these are messages between Tario and the MPD. Tario is communicating with the police. And they're actually talking about November dates, January 16th dates, February 2020 dates, February 28th dates, tons of exhibits, all the way leading up into October 13th. Text is going fast. She's typing away. We're getting closer to January 6 exhibits. All being read into the record. Do you have any info on planned Saturday night events? Tario says March at 6 p.m. That's the December date. We're still in December. Now January 4th. Where are you, what are you guys doing on January 4th? Staying at the Phoenix Park Hotel. Shane Lamont confirms that. All of these exhibits are read in. Hernandez is up. She says there are two items, Judge, that we need to talk about. Talking about admissibility of some information. And I wonder, see if we get to Carmen's next witness. So they're still debating about some of this evidence. Now the jury is brought back in. We have another stipulation that's being read into the record. Here's what they're telling, telling us about Zachary Real. The parties agree Carmen Hernandez is reading this into the record for the jurors. She says, I want to tell you a little bit about my client, okay? Zachary Real enlisted in the Marine Corps, 2008. Honorably discharged, 2012. 2010, promoted from private first class to E2 Lance Corporal E3. Later, promoted to Corporal E4. Real earned a Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal, his unit awarded commendation as a traffic management specialist. His responsibilities included shipping equipment to Marines overseas. Real suffered a lower back injury during a time on a traffic management team, shoulder injury on an obstacle court. Injuries led to an honorable discharge, attended Temple University, GI benefits, earned a Bachelor in Business Administration. Innovation and management, 3.5 GPA, didn't attend a rally in the D.C., wasn't at the Airbnb on 1-5, and was present at the location at the plaza. Was not present at the location when Charles Donahue threw a water bottle at the officers. Was present in a different area. Reel's phone shows metadata that says his video was taken at 1:25. He was not present on the Upper West Terrace. And between these times, he was not present when that window was shattered. This ends the stipulation. The judge says, I can report to you, ladies and gentlemen. The end is in sight. Says, we're not sitting on Friday or Monday. Uh-oh, so we've got nothing going tomorrow. We'll start on Tuesday at 11 a.m. And the rest of the week, we'll be conferring and letting you know what is coming. Judge says, things are in flux here. But we'll let you know what happens next week. Thanks for the evidence. Now, attorneys for Joe Biggs and Tario, they say, we're done. We presented all of our evidence. Hernandez says, we still have motions that we want to put forward. Nick Smith says, we're not quite done yet. 
and Roots still has the foremost window expert. Judge Kelly says, hey, Roger, are you done with your motions? Is that your last motion in the case? He says, no, not even close. What are you, nuts? Emphatically, no, 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 Judge. No, 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 no. We're just getting warmed up over here. Thanks for asking, though. No, we have a process server on Ray Epps, and we are not giving up on Ray Epps. He's dodging service, says Roots. If he's here on Tuesday, maybe we'll hear from him. Guess what? Ray Epps is not going to be here on Tuesday. <laughs> so there is a subpoena that looks like it was validated, but the service by publication was not validated. So Ray Epps will very unlikely, you know, be be appearing in court. He's dodging service. Kinnearson, the prosecutor, says, you know, this Roots witness, the window expert, they've received no information about him. We don't have anything about his resume or his name. He's going to bring in a window expert to tell us that the probably the Capitol building windows were made out of that movie glass. You know, you just sniff at it and it breaks. And we'll propose to exclude that on the basis. He says, well, it sounds like we might have evidence conclude on Tuesday. Wow. Roots isn't happy. He says, Your Honor, the government lied in this case. They misrepresented evidence about the window expert. He says the government put on false evidence. And judge says, no, 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 no. Stop. Take it easy, Roots. That's not correct at all. He says, you've used the wonder of cross-examination, and hopefully the truth emerges. You have a right to put on fact evidence in your case, but the question is here is whether providing notice, like literally today, he says it wasn't today, it was December. Kelly says, but they didn't say, they, they say they didn't get it until today. And they're fighting and Brandy doesn't catch it. He says, you didn't try, you didn't anticipate the government would try to argue the case. Brandy continues. They talk about the juror scheduling issue next week. Prosecutor tells the court, let's not release him. Advise the juror that maybe they can shift their commitment. Tell them you're not going on your trip. Hernandez is still talking, talking about the schedule. Kelly said, we'll now know by Tuesday if the defendants may testify. Is Zach Real going to testify? We don't know. Prosecutor says, we want notice if they're going to testify. And they say Sunday's a good deadline, maybe Monday morning. Wow. Okay. This is nuts. So Kelly agrees with McCullough, says you need defense counsel to represent by Sunday, whether your clients are going to be available to testify. Mech, the defense says Sunday's Easter. Can we have Monday morning to get our deadlines? Kelly says, yeah, it's true. It's Easter. That stinks. But no, you need to have these discussions with your clients Friday and Saturday. And then you also need to give us an answer on Easter. And am I mistaken or did not, did they not give the government additional time till Monday to respond to the defense motion? They did, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Dominic Pozzola, his defense, Roger Roots. Remember they submitted the motion that we just read through? Just to be clear about how unfair this is. The defense asked for time to respond till Monday. Judge says no. The government asks for time to respond to a defense motion until Monday. The judge says yes. Sorry, it's Easter. You have to figure it out. Metcalf says, well, it's fine. Our client's probably going to testify. We might be hearing from Dominic Pozzola. Wow. Norm Pattis says Joe Biggs is not going to testify. And that's the end of the trial. And so shout out, ultra shout outs to Brandy Buckman. She's really leaving. No trial tomorrow. Not going to see you then. Monday is also going to be closed in, in Proud Boys trials. So we'll be back on Tuesday. And so ultra shout out. Thank you to Brandy Buckman for live tweeting this whole thing. Amazing job and very interesting day. Over 40 confidential human sources. The government has plenty of time to respond to that, to make whatever they can come up with as their argument. And Judge Kelly will listen to that and very likely rule, but none of it will come in. Unlikely that Ray Epps gets served by Tuesday. Hopefully, fingers crossed, maybe that'll happen. But that is it for Proud Boys Trial Day 52. At least 40 informants, agents, sources, who knows, all embedded. And more will be revealed on that. Of course, we'll continue to cover. Thank you for liking this video and subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. And we'll look forward to seeing you.
on the next one. All right, my friends. That is it for us on the day. Boy, we covered some good ground here today. Proud Boys trial, 40 sources, Alvin Bragg and Mark Pomerantz now under scrutiny of Congress. We're looking forward to see what the House GOP can do. But now let's see what you have to say about all of this and more from our friends at watchingthewatchers.locals.com and from our super chat friends on YouTube. We'll say hello to Rumble and we'll say hello to Twitter. Before we go over for our members only, debrief in a very, very short minute. But let's see who else is here. We had a couple super chats come in. Thank you, everybody, for these lovely, lovely donos. Jeff Pearson kicked us off to start the show, says, send Trump to prison and he'll get the gangs to sign a peace treaty. Bring unity in the prisons. Yeah, probably turn it into a nice... um a nice resort in there, probably very, you know, peaceful, probably nice, you know, increase the quality of the beds and all of the things. Thank you for that, Jeff. Maybe, maybe put a golf course in there. Who knows? Tony Hay Munkets says Congress needs to go after the media. Freedom of press doesn't mean that they can lie to the people. I'm really tired of this from Tony Hay Munkets. I, I understand you on that. I think Congress well, you know, they could defund NPR and a lot of those other entities. They could certainly make some recommitments to free speech and giving us more freedom of speech without outsourcing the censorship to private companies. But Tony, I know you're tired of it, but boy, I would be a little bit, you know, we just published a restrict video, the restrict act. I published that this morning. We talked about that for our members only stream this morning. Not good. It might be going the other way in terms of more censorship and more restrictions. Lucky lady, thank you, lucky lady, sending in a super chat from Europe in euros. Thank you, lucky lady. Says thanks, thank you, I appreciate that. And Stephen Mosher sending in over a nice cup of coffee, which will be delicious when I drink it. Thank you there, Stephen. I appreciate you as well. Hey, Fred Petamonte's here with his rascally dog, Johnny. He says, Rob, Johnny's done. Time to stop nicey nice. Republican DAs and AGs need to fight fire with fire. Go after Clinton, Joe, Elias, Soros, Schiff, etc. Enough, Johnny. Boy, man, Johnny's upset. You don't want to upset Johnny. You know what happens there. He might drag in a prosecutor into your bedroom and then stuff him with uranium or something. Anyways, good to see you there, Fred Petamonte and Johnny, and thank you for the tip. Jonah Ryan's here says it's almost like DHS was created by the son of a corrupt CIA director. Spelt it out so you didn't get jabbed. You didn't get uh, raided by the feds, but I did for saying it. Thanks, Jonah. Staffed almost entirely by those who are loyal to his father from the go. Yeah, good comment. All of these different entities. And Jonah, remember, remember chuck schumer when he said that trump if he goes after the intelligence agencies they know how to get you six ways from sunday or whatever that was turns out that's kind of true huh looks like it's coming to fruition here's another one from sean wookie says who has not seen the millennial millie video coup d'etat they planned it more than two months ago this is a false flag with different groups and i don't know those names I don't think I've seen that video, Sean Wookie. I might have to look that one up. I don't even think I've seen it. Who hasn't seen it? Probably put me on that list, but I'll have to take a look at it. It's an interesting super chat. Thank you for sending that in. I'm very grateful, everybody, for sending those in. Thank you to our new members who joined as members. We do morning headline streams. We do daily debriefs and after parties, and they're a lot of fun. And so come check us out, of course, at watchingthewatchers.locals.com or as a member on YouTube. We also want to thank our friends over on Rumble. Who is on the Rumble chat? Let's see who is in the house. We've got Chappaquiddick Drinker. Wait a minute. Is that, is that Ted Kennedy? Is that Ted Kennedy in the house? Find out where Nancy Pelosi is sending the Ray Epps paychecks. I don't know. As a side note, Glenn Beck third hour today was real amazing. Interesting. Worth listening to. I wonder what he was talking about. Chappaquiddick, Jan X over there. Good stuff. Nick Danger's over there. Eric Scorpio, Army Brat, Fairy Dance, Gonzo, and our friend Blue Bunny's over there as well. NC Native over on Rumble. We love our Rumble friends. Thanks for watching over on Rumble. 
And lastly, let's see who's over on Twitter before we wrap it up today, my friends. We have, let's, are there people? Watch, three people. Oh my goodness. It's out of control on Twitter. That's what it was yesterday. It's this thing. It's just me and Vienti kiss. <laughs> we have, uh, says Rob, 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 you got to use proper terminology and you wonder why everyone's screaming nonsense. It's not a pendulum that swings back and forth in these matters. It's a wrecking ball that swings the other way. Remember, people are only honest when I find it convenient for them to be. From V. James Pepper says, Congress interfered with state sovereignty during civil rights. I guess Bragg wants to negate that authority. Deplorable Fred says, Johnny said, great work, Robert. Thank you, Johnny. And Troublemaker Josh is also here. Says, it, it's almost like this guy specific I don't know what that one is from troublemaker Jonah Jonah did you did you call the Ray up stuff is that what you're saying very interesting all right so those are from our friends over on Twitter we appreciate our Twitter friends saying hello Sean Wookie said this in the chat says Rob is controlled opposition or a grifter or both the Twitter assault starts today well, I don't know what that means it doesn't sound good to me at all I'm looking forward to whatever that is all right, well, good to see you, Sean. Hopefully you're okay over there. We had another couple questions come in and Rumble friends are over there, but we're going to wrap it up right there. We're going to go over to our locals party debrief, our after party, and see what else is going on from our friends at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. So come check us out where we have a lot of fun before and after the show. We've got a private Telegram group. If you're a member on YouTube, don't forget to grab that link and join us there. Also, don't forget to grab your Field of Greens from our friends over at fieldofgreens.com where you can save 15% with code Robert when you get your healthy fruits and vegetables at fieldofgreens.com. The vegetables want to be eaten and you can save your 15%. Don't forget to use code Robert. Also, if you like the mind map and you want to use this mind map stuff, you can check it out at spotlightlawyer.com slash mind map. I use this stuff for all sorts of projects and you can use them as well. Also, you can get the Trump mind map at spotlightlawyer.com slash Trump if you want to poke around there. Thank you to the mods who mod down the fort for us. We appreciate you. Vienti Kiss Prime. Appreciate your brother. K Bean, Just Cause, Playing Hooky, Ronnie Cole, Zulu. Geo and Zach Nichols, along with John Allen. Also, shout outs to our friend Sleepy Dog Lee and Jigam Gigam over on Locals. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. And so we are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We're also going to be on Telegram. So if you're not on Telegram, if you're a YouTube member, get that link, baby, because we're not done yet. We want to see you over there. And we'll look forward to seeing you there. But that is it for us today, my friends. We'll be back here tomorrow to do it all again. I hope to see you here. Same time, same place, same location. Bring a friend and we'll do it all together so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a great night, my friends. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.